Alrighty. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Simon Says. Um, so today I'm going to tackle a topic that's, um, that's popping up a lot in our, uh, in our society at the moment, and that is the LGBT community. Um, so to begin with, we're going to start with some disclaimers and warnings just about um, the content and, and my approach, I suppose. So my expertise is that as, as a scientist and an educator. Um, so that's my background, and I, I'm also a Christian. Um, so I have no particular ties with the LGBT community. So I'm speaking from um, a research that I've found online, essentially. Um, so I've tried to keep my sources from peer-reviewed scientific journals um, and, and the Bible as well for the Christian view. And so I've tried to avoid um, news, opinion pieces, social media, anything that would be less than um, objective as possible. Um, that's my goal. Uh, so I'll be using LGBT as a catch-all term, so I apologise if um, I'm not saying that correctly. I do recognise the differences, um, but I'm, I might just say that as, as a convenience. And on um, content warning, we'll be touching on things like sexual abuse, assault, confronting things involving children, that kind of stuff. So just be aware uh, before we get started today. All right, so first, let's begin with some definitions so we know what we're talking about. Um, so firstly, we have sexual orientation. So this is a word which indicates which sex an individual is attracted to. And so you might think of that simply as being gay or straight, bi. Um, so the type of person you, you'd be interested in, essentially. Um, so next is gender. And so that's a range of characteristics pertaining to femininity or masculinity. And, um, and that is converse to sex, which is your biological birth state of being a male, XY chromosomes, or female, XX or there are other rare um, combinations as well. Um, so essentially, sex is how your body presents at birth, physically, um, you know, how did, how did it um, begin? Whereas gender is how someone views themselves up here in terms of their identity, how, how they act, how they, how they present themselves, um, that sort of thing. And so gender dysphoria is where an individual's gender up here, they don't view themselves in terms of being the same as their birth sex. And so that causes, um, dysphoria just means distress. And so, so that's something that um, people have to struggle with. And um, trans people are individuals who've taken steps um, towards having their physical presentation. Um, so to, ref to better reflect the gender that they identify with um, in, in their mind. And so, so that can be you know, extremes like surgery. It might be simply things like changing their names or how they look, how they dress, how they act, things like that. All right, so let's get stuck into it. Um, so an overview, we're going to touch about the get on the gay community and so talk about has science found a gay gene? Are there environmental or cultural factors that, um, you know, might contribute to people, <coughs> excuse me, um, um, identifying as, as being part of the, the gay or lesbian or bi community? Then we'll talk about the trans community as well. So trans in young people, that's, that's a big um, trend going on in recent times. We'll also have a look at some interesting surveys, um, some from parents and also some who are um, some who have detransitioned as well. And lastly, we'll, we'll touch on what I feel is, um, what I believe is the ideal Christian response and um, from, from what we can find in the Bible. So let, let's jump in. All right, so firstly, the gay gene, it's one that seems to pop up on the news every now and then. Um, and so most recently in 2019, there was a huge study, about half a million people um, looking at their entire genomes, their entire DNA um, sequence code, and this provided yet another study that confirmed there, there is no single gay gene. Science has found that that is not to be a thing. Um, but with that said, they did five genes, which actually accounted for a small amount of variation for those with a preference of same-sex behavior. So eight to 25% of the variation could actually be um, described by um, genetic factors. And so, so at the bottom here, we've got all the chromosomes. We've all got a, a number of chromosomes. And some of these above this line, um, they appeared to contribute to um, same-sex attraction. And so this makes sense because, you know, as people, um, a, a lot of what we do is in some way influenced by our genetics. And so it, it, would, it would make sense that, um, um, you know, sexuality would also be influenced to some degree, but there's no one single gay gene magic bullet that we've been able to identify um, with science. All right, so secondly, environmental and cultural factors. So what are some other possibilities for um, that might contribute to someone becoming um, more likely to identify as being part of the LGB community. 
And so first one's a really interesting study. I'd, I'd never seen this before. Uh, so Blanchard and Sheridan described the fraternal birth order effect, which shows that the more older brothers um, a man has, the higher he has, it has a higher chance of being homosexual. Um, so if you have, so if a male was to have four older brothers, it almost doubles their odds that they would um, become a homosexual. And so the reason for this is that they would be suspected due to the immune, immune response from the mother who has a male, male child. And this may impact um, the way that the brain develops while the baby's in the womb. So basically a male is a different gender to um, the mother, um, sorry, different sex. And this triggers different immune responses in the body and, and they may interact with the development of that child, um, which increases their chance of um, identifying as, as being gay. Um, so there was also another study too that showed a significant majority of LGB individuals showed non-gender typical behaviors before age five. And so even at a very, very young age, um, they, they show clear preferences that um, different that differ from your typical gender norms per se. And so, so that, that's um, some clear evidence that um, the, these things, um, you know, um, that, that preference comes from a very young age. And it was like nearly all, it wasn't just a significant majority, it was pretty huge and I've got that link there. And um, lastly, um, on a totally separate note, there's, there's some evidence that LGB individuals are more likely to have experienced sexual abuse in their past. And so the author of this paper went to great pains to say that no abuse doesn't cause people to identify as homosexual, um, but, but there is some association there. We've talked a bit in the past about associations just being connections. Um, there's not necessarily um, like one thing does not cause the other, or maybe the other thing does not cause the thing. We need to find a causal link um, that would describe why that is happening. And, and that hasn't been um, discovered at this point. Um, but it is important to, to just be aware of and take into account as well. And so from, from this data here, um, I've highlighted CSA, which is um, child sexual abuse here. And so in this study, they actually compared siblings. So siblings who were heterosexual versus bisexual or gay. So they came from the same family. Um, so their genetics are probably fairly similar. Um, their background environment is you know, close if you live in the same house, often that sort of thing. Um, and, and they found this significantly large difference between um, the bisexual and gay individuals relative to their heterosexual siblings. And so there's, so there's this clear link between abuse in the background. Um, but again, the author went to great, great, um, great, great lengths to suggest this doesn't cause this, but there's an interesting connection here. We need to consider this. We need to look at that and think about what that might mean. All right, so I'm going to come back to that thought in a moment. Um, but first, I want, I want to um, move towards looking a little bit at trans in, um, in particular. And so to do that, I want to start talking about sex and gender. Um, so we, we've looked at those definitions before, sex being um, how the body presents at birth, gender being um, an identity in terms of how they present in their mind. Um, and hormones, um, we, we know, are, are linked to this. And so androgens, for example, um, like testosterone in high levels, they drive the development of uh, masculine male features. Um, so no, lots of hair, lots of muscle um, relative to, to what someone with less testosterone might have. And so this can drive um, uh, specific physical um, characteristics and behavior in adults. Sorry, that should say sex specific. Um, and so, so, so those are the things that might, um, you know, that they're allow, allows, um, um, the male sex to develop in that way, for example. Um, and variation in hormone levels can actually cause change in features throughout life. And so, for example, as we age, our hormone balances change. And this is the reason why you might see older females developing more facial hair, for example, maybe like a, a little moustache, just a small amount. Um, whereas in males, they might start to develop breast tissue, not, not simply because of weight gain, but actual um, breast tissue development because of those hormonal imbalances. So, so we can see the, the effect that they can have on, um, you know, th th these are things that we see and, and that, that happen quite commonly. And so, um, so obviously these hormones can um, manipulate our bodies and, and change them. And so in the case of um, trans individuals, if, if they, um, <clears throat> if they want to um, go about changing their sex because of their, um, their gender identity, um, that they might be prescribed specific drugs. So for example, um, in the beginning, um, particularly if they're at a young age, they might be issued puberty blockers. 
And so they'll actually block the hormones that drive those sex specific changes. Um, so they're, they're like a bit of a pause button in the meantime, the body will um, um, not, not develop those very specific um, sex related features. Or um, in time, they may move to hormones as well. They may take testosterone, for example, and that would um, drive development of those specific male features. Um, so there's also examples of um, what can go, um, go wrong um, or, or go, go atypical rather in terms of um, um, hormone levels. And so, for example, there's a condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And this is a condition associated with higher androgen levels circulating. And this has been associated with increased rates of homosexuality in women, for example. Um, so we see these hormones, you know, regardless of who, where, or when, um, we all have hormone levels fluctuate and they can change, um, you know, um, facets about us. All right, so let's move specifically to um, trans in youth. And so as an educator, um, I'm starting to see a lot of this. Um, this is a really, really growing trend. Um, and it's disproportionately affecting young females at this point. And so, so we all know that young people, um, you know, particularly in um, mid high school, that sort of thing, they're developing their identity, their place in the world. And so, so trans is, is another outlet um, to experiment with because um, that's now possible because of technology and, and our society is becoming uh, more, more accepting and um, accommodating for that as well. And so um, we know that young people like to find support and attention and encouragement from their peer groups. And with social media these days, that's just kind of um, exploded and it's, and it's driving um, different trends. And so in recent times, for example, um, puberty blockers have been given to as many as 800 children in the UK, some as young as 10. And even in the USA, we're, looking, we're seeing things like breast removal surgery for 13 year olds. And so, so things are changing. We need to consider things that we haven't seen before. And that's particularly true in the education space where we see a lot of young people um, coming from all sorts of backgrounds that, that, that we need to um, you know, cater for and, and affirm and support in their education and, and as people. So I'm going to show some data now in terms of some of these trends. And so this one is um, the, um, the number of trans individuals, and I believe this was in the UK. And so you can see that this was um, a quite, num uh, quite a small number in the late 2000s. Um, but in recent times, that, that's just growing hugely, um, mostly in adolescence. And you can see the yellow here is adolescent females. So they're, they're outnumbering the males by quite a way. So these dots here indicate a significant increase on the previous year. So that's statistical significance. And so year on year on year, we're seeing a growth that you wouldn't just expect by population growth or chance. There's a clear trend here. And interestingly, um, I note that the real surge begins at 2011, when 2011 was the year that smartphone ownership hit the half point. And from 2011, we started seeing a lot of trends like mental health issues, anxiety, depression, because uh, there are clear links with things like social media there. And I think it's fair to say that things like social media, but of course, other factors as well, um, are probably driving some of these trends that we see here. All right, next is um, another UK one, um, a survey, an LGBT um, um, survey, sorry, is from the LGBT survey. And these were um, results from trans people. And we can see that natal females, so, so born female at birth, um, they account for a huge percentage of the, um, the young individuals. And in the upper demographics, it seems to be more males. Uh, the only exception being here, but that's because um, natal females tend to live longer, I'd say. Um, so we can see that this trend is changing hugely based on what it, what it has in the past. And presumably there are some different drivers for that reason. All right, so um, another interesting um, piece of data that I found was some parent survey findings. So they surveyed parents of um, young trans people to kind of try and find out some of the issues that they've been struggling with and what that looks like. And some interesting stats that popped up from that were 40% of the young people who stated, um, sorry, in this survey who identified as transgender, they stated a non-hetero orientation beforehand. So, so there's, um, um, so there, there, there's trans as, as um, one thing to consider, but it's often, um, you know, can, can be related to LGB as well. And so, um, and we'll talk about the effect that, that can have later as well. Um, so 62.5% have been prior diagnosed with at least one mental health disorder or neuromental disability before their transgender identification. So often these young people are struggling with a number of things. And in 36.8% of cases, the majority of their friend groups were transgender identification too. 
So um, potentially there'll be a huge effect from their peers. And we know that young people are um, influenced by their peers more than anything else. And so, so it makes sense that um, we might see these little clusters perhaps, but it is worth noting that for this survey, they're recruited from Facebook groups. And so we might see a bias towards people who are more socially, um, more connected to social media, for example. All right, and then further down, we saw 47.2% reported a decline in mental health after transgender identification. So it wasn't the magic fix, um, or at least the parents didn't view it to be. They, they viewed their child um, struggled more um, after they were um, identified as being transgender. And 57.2 reported a decline in their relationship with the child as well, which is certainly a concern. But, um, um, but to an extent, we'd ex we would expect that too if, they're, you know, if um, you know, young people are struggling with um, a lot of issues and need support. All right, so here's a summary quote that I found really interesting from, um, um, it wasn't any of these papers, but it was a related topic. And I've highlighted the interesting parts here. And so this one was specific to gender dysphoria, GD. And so some clinicians and researchers are concerned that for certain trans youth, um, the subjective experiences that they feel about their gender dysphoria, how they identify are related to underlying mental health issues or difficulties in adolescent development. And so they do not to decrease after medical treatment. So some researchers are worried that um, in, in young people um, who are identifying as trans, they may, you know, there may be some other things going on that we need to be careful and aware of, as I touched on earlier with some of our other data. Whereas on the other side, there's, there's another group of clinicians that's um, subscribed to the minority stress hypothesis. Um, from my readings, this appeared to be the dominant one, um, to, um, um, just, just for context. And this harm posits that co-occurring mental health challenges among trans youth are the result of growing up in environments that are not inclusive of gender conformity. So some researchers are worried that, hey, these young people have issues. Um, trans seems to appear there. Um, is trans related to those issues in some way? Where others are over here, I know these people have identified as trans from a young age and they are becoming stressed because of that, because of um, you know the stresses of people not accepting them or society not... Um, helping them to fit in. So, so it's a bit of a chicken and an egg situation. And so researchers are still really grappling with that. And I felt that that kind of summarized that nicely. And so at the end, they concluded that the current, current body of knowledge on um, trans youth with gender dysphoria indicates they comprise a heterogeneous group with various clinical needs. So basically people are different. They expect a whole bunch of stuff and that makes sense. People are complicated, psychology is complicated. Um, we'd expect to see a whole range of people um, exhibiting a whole range of things because of a whole range of reasons. And that kind of makes sense from what we're seeing across both. All right, so moving to detransitioning. So this is when someone um, decides that they, they no longer identify as trans. And so I found an interesting survey from, um, this is a really recent survey from 100 detransitioning trans people. Um, so they're all aged 18 or over, 69% were natal female. Um, so take from that what you will. I don't know the age spread off the top of my head. You can look at the paper. We have links there. Um, it has a lot of the reasons that they chose to um, detransition. And sadly, one of them was um, one of the big issues was 23%. They experienced a lot of discrimination. Um, and so they felt that others were making their choice too hard for them. And so, so they reverted um, um, from identifying as trans. Um, so second one was becoming more comfortable identifying with their natal sex, so 60%. So uh, indicated maybe some sort of acceptance being um, a big reason for that. Um, another big issue was concerns about medical complications, 49%. So all of these individuals had some sort of medical intervention, whether it was hormones or, or other, and half of them had issues with that, which is, um, which is not good. Um, and, the, and a number came to view their gender dysphoria as having a specific root like trauma, abuse, or mental health. That's 38%. Um, so that ties in with what we mentioned earlier with some of those links and stats that we saw before. Um, so while some, um, some clinicians are saying, no, it's the stress, but uh, they identify and then they have stress because of persecution. Um, but some of the people detransitioning were saying, no, I think it was actually something else um, at the root of it. And so 55% did not feel they had an adequate evaluation from a doctor or mental health professional. That is terrifying, especially if there are a lot of young people experiencing this. They don't have a whole lot of life experience. Their brains are still developing. Um, they need support to, to navigate that. And so the fact that half 
felt they didn't is very scary to me. And 23% originally transitioned because they couldn't view themselves as LGB. So again, um, um, the, the, uh, the tie between gender and sexual orientation, some, some didn't want to identify as gay and they preferred to identify as trans and, uh, and, and then came to detransition as a result of not finding that, um, you know, um, what they thought it would be. And then lastly, only 24% had informed their clinicians that they had detransitioned. So that tells me that our statistics on detransitioning are not likely to be great if only a quarter of them um, report their changes. So how many people come to detransition? Um, so it's more common in the early stages. So, so people might go along that path and realize quite early, hang on, you know, that's not for me. Um, but the number of detransitions is quite unknown. So I've seen a common estimate at 1%. Um, I've seen a clinician quote that recently. Um, but I've seen some going up to 8% too. So that's a huge discrepancy. When you consider that the majority of them um, didn't appear to report from that survey, that number could, it could be higher. Who, who knows? We don't have good data yet. And so studies have reported higher rates of desistance among prepubertal children. So 26 um, DEEM review of 10 prospective follow-up studies found desistance rates ranging from 61 to 98%. So, so a majority stop at an early stage. Um, with evidence suggesting that it might be less than 85% more generally. Um, so obviously we need more research in this area, particularly as these trends are changing and hugely in the last 10 years, that it might, it might be different again. And so, so, so we need to put more effort into studying here. And soberingly, um, some people have even stated the fact that suicide might be an, an additional fact that I'm reporting. We know that um, people from the LGBT community are, um, um, you know, they have much higher rates of... Um, you know, uh, mental health and suicide and um, people who, who are no longer here are unable to report. And so that might be another issue in that research in this area. All right, so, so that's, that's what I've been able to discover from the science and what the science says. Um, let's now consider the Christian response. So I went straight to the Bible and, and I looked for what I, I was hoping to find was the ideal um, response for Christians to the LGBT community. Um, so obviously there's a lot of well-publicized well, well issues there and have, have been in the past. <clears throat> so the Old, Old and New Testaments are clear that sex was designed by God to be within the marriage of a man and a woman as part of his plan for creation. And so I've got a, got a, um, um, a, a verse from Mark here, which um, quotes Genesis from, from right at the beginning of the Bible. God made the male and female. Man will leave his father and mother to be united with his wife and they'll become one flesh. Um, so so that, was, that was God's intent for marriage when he created humans, um, as according to the Bible. And so secondly, I found um, another, another um, verse saying, we're fearfully and wonderfully made and we each have our own unique purpose. And this includes more feminine, feminine males and masculine women. Society doesn't always value um, the full spectrum of people and how they present. Um, but the Bible says that we've been fearfully and wonderfully made um, and God had a plan for you. In Jeremiah, it says, plans to prosper you, not to harm us, give us a hope and a future. So God made us as we are, perfectly with a plan. All right, and so, so with that, um, obviously that um, creates potential for conflict or difference of ideas. And so um, as, as if, you, if you were to call yourself a Christian, how does that fit? How does that work? And for example, as a Christian, can I hold a non-Christian to my Christian values? Um, well, I, I don't expect an atheist to hold me to an atheist value. So, so how could a Christian expect a non-Christian um, to adhere to their values? And so, so I, I, I view our um, response as being one where we should communicate if we're asked um, what the Bible says, um, but we're not going out to there to condemn people. Jesus always said, most important commandments, love God, love others, done, simple as that. Um, so we're not called to judge. That's God's um, role alone on judgment day. Um, you know, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. Um, nowhere should it say that people are judged. In fact, we're said um, to not judge because we'll be judged with the same measure. So obviously we want to be going easy on others in that regard. Um, but what are we called to do? We're called to share the gospel and make disciples. We're called, called to um, tell, tell the good news that Jesus died for our sins. We've all fallen short. We need his forgiveness so that we can be made right with God and have eternal life. Um, so we're called to share that make disciples and our Christians, the Bible says are a new creation and God has a plan for each of us. What that looks like, he'll guide us in that and he can 
empower us and transform us to, um, you know, to grow us to be the people that he's made us to be. All right, so that's about it for me. So we looked at um, a range of definitions. We talked about um, whether there's a gay gene or what are some environmental or cultural factors that might affect um, people and how they identify with their social orientation. We also spoke about the trans community with a very specific focus on young people in recent times, um, as well as so we looked at statistics, but also survey findings from both parents and people that have detransitioned as well. And we looked at um, the ideal um, Christian response and that Christians should be loving and supportive but we should share the gospel. We should communicate what the Bible says when we're asked. And, um, and, and you know, God has a plan for all of us and loves all of us. Um, so I've got some references here too, if you'd like to check out those at a later time um, or have a chat to me if you have any questions. Um, as again, thank you for listening. I really appreciate it.